bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, the BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. CAFC would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which include this CAFC Presents webinar series, the CAFC Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. And as CAFC celebrates its 50th anniversary, be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletters, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with our latest webinars and to track our activities as we celebrate our 50th year. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think would be of interest. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box or share them on Twitter at any time during the presentation. Don't forget to tag at CAFC Tweets and use the hashtag CAFC Presents. Hello, everyone. And welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, uh, an Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centres. And today we're going to be talking about the national impact of an enhanced train-the-trainer model for delivering pediatric palliative care education. Uh, palliative care, certainly a, 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 a topic of interest for the CAFC community. We've had lots of presentations, including today's presenter, who pre has presented with us in the past. But before we get on to that, I just wanted to make a quick mention uh, of, our, of the 2018 CAFC Annual Conference, uh, Fresh Thinking, Brave Ideas, which is coming up October 21st to the 23rd and will be held in Edmonton, Alberta. And we want to thank our colleagues at the Stollery Children's Hospital and the Glen Rose, and the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital for their support and all, the, all of the hard work that the volunteers at those organizations have been putting in to help us get ready for this event. Uh, the program is on the uh, CAFC website at CAFC.org. Uh, there's lots of time to register. Uh, and uh, so hopefully we'll see lots of our CAFC Presents webinar audience uh, in person at the, uh, at the annual conference. All right, so as I mentioned, palliative care is certainly a topic of interest, uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kim Widger to the to the stage today uh, to do her presentation. If you recall, she's been on the, the CAFC Presents webinars actually many times, and I think I believe she's presented a couple of times at our conference, often with her colleague, uh, Dr. Adam Rappaport. Today, she's going solo. Uh, and uh, Dr. Widger is an assistant professor at the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto, and she's also a project investigator at the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, her research focuses on identifying and measuring structures, processes, and outcomes that are indicative of high-quality pediatric palliative and end-of-life care, and finding ways to ensure optimal care is provided regardless of setting or diagnosis. So, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to Dr. Kim Widger. Great. Thank you very much, Doug. I'm happy to be back. Uh, you can see slides now? Yes. Okay, so I'm pleased to be talking today about a project that uh, we completed almost a year ago already. Um, and Adam and I presented on this topic, uh, I think about two years ago when we were sort of midway through. So this is a bit of an update in terms of how things actually played out through the rest of the uh, project. So today I'm going to identify implementation science-based strategies that we use to enhance pediatric palliative care on a national level, identify some issues with measuring changes in practice, and then identify some of our successes and challenges of actually achieving practice change. So I want to start off by acknowledging the funding for this particular project, which was from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and through Health Canada. And of course, the views expressed in my presentation do not represent the views of Health Canada or CPAC. So also want to acknowledge my uh, project team. Adam Rappaport was the co-investigator or co-principal investigator for this project. And then we were uh, lucky enough to have a wonderful group of clinicians and researchers from across Canada and from the US to help us move this project forward. So meet Elena. Elena was six when she was diagnosed with leukemia. Her mom describes getting the news. They started telling us about the WISH Foundation, and the rest was a blur. I started to cry. Ugly, sobbing, can't catch your breath crying. Sure that this was their way of telling me that my little girl was going to die. 
We were devastated. Our 10-year-old daughter, Caitlin, was upset about all the attention being on Elena. Our barely three-year-old son, Cohen, had horrible screaming nightmares where he was seeing Elena as a ghost in the mirror on his dresser. Elena herself calmly announced, you know, I always knew I would die when I was eight. Everything seemed like a bad omen. Every blood work was stressful. Any delays in getting results made me think something was wrong, and they were just waiting for the oncologist to be available to come and tell us that Elena had relapsed. Even for children like Elena, who have a very high likelihood of becoming a long-term cancer survivor, suffering is nearly universal right from the time of diagnosis. And addressing this suffering is an ethical imperative for all health professionals. Pediatric palliative care is the art and science of patient and family-centered care aimed at enhancing quality of life, promoting healing, and attending to suffering. So does that mean that a family like Elena's needs to meet with a specialist pediatric palliative care team at the time of diagnosis? Not likely but she does need her oncology team to be able to provide a basic or generalist level of palliative care throughout her treatments. Unfortunately, parents tell us that there's room for improvement in terms of consistently providing this type of care to families. And health professionals themselves tell us that they do not receive enough or sometimes any training in how to support families in the midst of this suffering. So to address the reported lack of education and enhance the quality of palliative care for children with cancer and their families across the 16 pediatric oncology centers in Canada, we rolled out a new, at the time at least, uh, evidence-based curriculum called Education in Palliative and End-of-Life Care for Pediatrics, or EPIC-PEDS. And then we evaluated the success of our rollout in four key areas, so around knowledge dissemination, knowledge of health professionals, practice changes, and quality of palliative care. So briefly, a little bit about the EPIC-PEDS curriculum. It was developed by Stefan Friedrichsdorf, Joanne Wolf, Stacy Remke, and Joshua Hauser, who are all based in the U.S. It uses a train-the-trainer model, where there are master facilitators who are first uh, created and trained. They go on to train trainers, and then those trainers go on to train health professionals. This is done through both online modules and a face-to-face -face conference. So the master facilitators and trainers have access to the online modules to make sure they have a good uh, level of understanding of pediatric palliative care. Then they come together in a face-to-face -face conference to complete more modules together, but also really focus on learning how to teach the actual curriculum. Additionally, the EPIC-PEDS curriculum encourages quality improvement through something called a TIPS kit, which is the Tailored Implementation of Practice Standards Kit, which is essentially a toolbox of resources to implement quality improvement projects locally. And the one included within EPIC-PEDS is focused on uh, use of the Memorial Symptom Assessment Scale. So the modules that are available uh, these are the list of modules that are completed online by the trainers and master facilitators. So you can see about 50% of it is really around pain and symptom management. And initially, when the curriculum was um, first launched, the focus was on having physicians and advanced practice nurses, nurse practitioners, become the trainers um, rather than more psychosocial support people because the feeling was that it would be a challenge for them to teach any of the uh, more symptom-based modules. And so anyways, that was their focus to start. But when we did our project, we were much more um, inclusive in encouraging any health professional uh, to actually become a trainer. So then, as I said, face-to-face -face modules are also completed uh, these modules focus on self-care, team collaboration, communication and planning, and then a couple of sessions just around how to actually teach about pain and symptom management uh, and how to teach EPIC-PEDS overall. The EPIC-PEDS curriculum is what they call an accordion curriculum. This means that the trainers essentially have a wealth of resources that they're able to choose from 
but they can pick and choose what they want and adapt that for whatever audience they're going to be speaking to, as well as what kind of time frame they might be speaking for. So a particular module might have 100 slides, but the trainer might be wanting to go out and do a 10-minute sort of quickie presentation, and so they can pick and choose from uh, what slides uh, and what content they actually want to present. And we thought this was a real strength of the Epic PEDS curriculum. Uh, it fit with the idea uh, from implementation science, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, of really trying to adapt uh, knowledge to the local uh, context and the local situation and local needs. So one of the questions um, might be, does Epic Peds actually work? And Epic Peds really was built on Epic, uh, which is designed for adult palliative care. The larger Epic has been widely disseminated and has been shown to improve knowledge and attitudes. There have been reports of practice improvement based on that rollout. We also know that train the trainer models more broadly around other kinds of topics have been linked to improved patient outcomes. But at the time that we started our project, the impact of EPIC or EPIC PEDS on patient outcomes had never really been formally assessed. So leading into uh, setting up and designing our project, I had actually just completed a postdoctoral fellowship at SickKids uh, with Dr. Bonnie Stevens focused around knowledge translation. So in thinking about how we were going to take this evidence-based newly developed curriculum and actually roll it out to improve practice across the country, I was uh, brought back to this model that I learned about in my postdoc called Promoting Action on Research uh, Implementation in Health Services. So we had good solid evidence. What we were working to put into place through our project was sort of the facilitation piece, as well as trying to create the best context for practice change so that we could see the outcomes that we were looking for. And so the implementation science-based sort of enhancements that I brought into the project started out by sharing local data. So we tried to collect all of our data about current quality of care prior to starting our rollout so that each site that was going to be taking part could see sort of where they stood locally and then they could decide where they wanted to make improvements. We focused on as well getting buy-in from the local teams. And so our project was aimed at the initially at the 16 pediatric oncology programs that are uh, across the country. One of those programs in the end was not able to take part, very small program, and really they just couldn't release enough people to come together to do uh, the face-to-face -face training. Uh, but we were aiming for larger buy-in from the medical directors, from the leadership teams at each of these programs across the country. We asked those leadership teams to identify people from their local area who would be interested in doing this training and who could be champions going forward. So these are the people who would become the trainers. And we asked that each of the 15 programs that took part in the end would identify between three and five health professionals. And our requirement was that one of those, at least one of those people would come from on the oncology program itself. One would come from the pediatric palliative care program, if in fact there was one at that center, and then one person from the community. So the community person might be uh, a general pediatrician who might provide care to children with cancer at home. It might be a home care nurse, uh, in Ontario, it was often an interlink nurse who became that community um, person as part of the healthcare team. The uh, original Epic Peds uh, training involves just a one day training, and people, basically anybody, can decide they want to become a trainer. They go and, and pay to take the training, come together for one day, and then they go home with all the resources. We wanted, uh, and implementation science would suggest, that it's better to have a team working together. So we brought together these teams. We added a day 
of the face-to-face training so that they could really spend time together, get to know each other if they didn't already. And we certainly had teams um, where oncology and palliative care actually hadn't uh, had a lot of interaction prior to our project. And in one case, there was no pediatric palliative care team. So we invited adult palliative care providers to come and join. uh, And they actually uh, really forged a strong relationship and have done a lot of work together um, since our project uh, completed. So in those two days, Uh, we asked as well for the teams to really think about what they were going to do when they got home. So in the usual epic, if you attend a session by yourself, you may go home, you may never actually do any of the training um, and disseminate that training to other health professionals in your home community. We wanted our regional teams to go home with a plan. So what are you actually going to do? Who do you need to target with this education? What kind of content do you think people need? So uh, a much more concrete plan. The other thing we did was added two new tips kits uh, focused around bereavement follow-up and goals of care discussion. And then we provided ongoing support for the team. So not just sending them off on their own and say get back to us in 18 months time when the project is over, but following up on at least a quarterly basis to say, you know, when we were together, here's what you said you were going to do. How's that going? And how can we help? Is there anything we can do Uh, to better support you as you roll out this education at home. In terms of our timeline, so back in spring 2014 was when we started this project, had a planning meeting in Toronto with all of our stakeholders. We trained our new Canadian master facilitators in the fall of 2014, started baseline data collection shortly after that. Uh, It did take a long time to do baseline data collection, and that was because of lots of challenges in getting ethics approval across 15 different sites and administrative approvals and data sharing agreements. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, Then in the spring of 2015, we had our Epic Peds face-to-face session for the trainers. And then each team had about a year, although it varied depending on the site and when they got the approvals, but they had a year to roll out the education and complete a quality improvement project. Then in October to December of 2016 was when we collected uh, all of our post-intervention data and then had a final project meeting, bringing everybody back together to talk about uh, successes and challenges at each of the sites and share our findings with our stakeholders. So again, our project outcomes that we started off um, trying to achieve was around knowledge dissemination, knowledge of health professionals, practice change outcomes, and quality of palliative care. So I'm now going to go through um, each of these individually. So in terms of knowledge dissemination, our goal initially was to create five master facilitators across Canada, which we managed to do. Then we wanted to have between 42 and 80 trainers based at each of the pediatric oncology programs in Canada. As I said, one of the 16 programs was not able to take part, but in the end, we had 72 trainers across the 15 uh, regional teams and 15 pediatric oncology programs. And then last but not least, we set what we thought was quite a lofty goal of reaching at least 600 health professionals from all across Canada. And we really wanted to cover the map as much as possible. But uh, as everybody on this call knows, I'm sure all of the pediatric tertiary centers are pretty localized in the southern part of Canada. Uh, So we weren't sure about really covering the map quite like we envisioned. However, we in fact reached 3,475 health professionals. And these numbers show how many uh, health professionals were completed some aspect of the curriculum across each province and territory. So we were in fact able to go coast to coast to coast across the country uh, and reach actually many more health professionals than we actually had even hoped for. So what kind of information did those end users, the health professionals, actually get? So the modules that were most frequently taught across the country was, first of all, just the introductory module on what is pediatric palliative care. 
also uh, most often taught was preparation for death, communication and planning, self-care, broad spectrum analgesia, and opioid selection and rotation. So in terms of the health professionals knowledge, our goal was really just that the majority of uh, people who took part in the uh, curriculum sessions would indicate that their knowledge improved. And so as you can see, uh, we certainly achieved that with the vast majority of people saying their knowledge of whatever topic was being presented had improved, that that information would enhance their practice. And was also nice to see that almost three quarters said that they would encourage some change at the organizational level in terms of adopt adopting new practices. So certainly our goal was achieved in this area as well. Then each of the sites, as I mentioned, had access to these tips kits. And so each site was encouraged to choose a topic and do a quality improvement project. And they were allowed to set whatever goal they wanted for that particular project and then assess whether or not they met that goal. So the topics chosen across the sites, seven sites focused on improving the symptom screening, four sites focused on bereavement follow-up, two sites on sibling support, one site looking at increased referrals to pediatric palliative care, and one site focusing on mouth care. So our goal was that 10 sites out of the 15 would achieve would successfully complete their project and actually achieve their goals. And that is in fact what we uh, got. So then data on care quality. So we looked at the quality of palliative care both before and after our rollout. So as a reminder from our timeline, our pre-test period was a very long period, but roughly went from January of 2015 to May 2016. Then there was time for the rollout of the education and the quality improvement projects. And then we collected all of the same data again uh, at the end of 2016. And keeping in mind that, as I said at the beginning, uh, palliative care can be appropriate for a child at any phase of their uh, cancer journey. It is appropriate at the time of diagnosis, not necessarily that you're calling a specialized pediatric palliative care team, but that there is a palliative approach to care. So that was sort of the vision that we had in mind when we were choosing what kind of data to actually collect and who to collect that data from. So we did surveys with children who were on any phase of active treatment for their cancer. Uh, so that could be children. We, we did um, not invite children who were within a month of diagnosis because we felt they were sort of dealing with enough. But beyond that, up until uh, either they were had active disease and were no longer dis receiving treatments, they, were, they did have advanced cancer, as well as children who had successfully completed treatment and had completed that treatment within the last three months. So a very broad range of children. Then we also did surveys with the parents of children who uh, similarly met those criteria, so we're on some kind of active treatment or had active disease. Then we did surveys with bereaved parents and chart reviews uh, of deceased patients. So we were really looking at changes across any of those areas from before to after our rollout. So in terms of the child perspective, we did the MSAS, which I mentioned before, the Memorial, the, sorry, Memorial Symptom Assessment Scale, and that is to assess symptom scores. We also looked at quality of life using the PEDS-QL. Unfortunately, we didn't see any changes in either of those two things. And to some degree, um, like the uh, tips kit that is focused on symptom assessment, it's really not focused actually on improving symptoms or reducing the burden of symptoms. It's actually just focused on asking about symptoms. So based on our belief that, of course, if you don't assess symptoms and quality of life regularly, you can't do anything to address those is issues. After we asked the children to complete the MSAS, at the end of all of those questions, we said, how often are you asked these kinds of questions about your symptoms? And then similarly, after they completed the quality of life survey, we also asked, how often are you asked about these kinds of questions when you come to the hospital, when you see your um, 
physicians and nurses who look after you. So this is showing the proportion of older and younger children who said that they are never or almost never asked about symptoms or quality of life. So it was heartening to see that the vast majority of children said that, in fact, they are asked regularly about their symptoms. Uh, less than 10% said they're never asked about their symptoms. But then looking at the quality of life kinds of questions, uh, almost 40 to 50% said that they are never asked about those kinds of things. So that's certainly um, a bit of a concern, I think. Uh, how can we fix not fix, but how can we improve quality of life if we're not really asking about that on a consistent basis? Uh, and as well, there were no changes, unfortunately, from um, before to after our rollout. The scores were similarly um, low in terms of frequency of asking about quality of life uh, throughout. So now we move on to the surveys with parents. So across the 15 participating sites, we had 325 parents complete our survey prior to our rollout, 213 completed it uh, in the post-test period. And again, these were parents of children of any age on active treatment, the way I defined it before. So the main subscales on this survey were questions asking about relationships with health professionals, how involved they felt as a parent in their child's care, how they saw information being shared among health professionals, how much sibling support either uh, directly provided to the siblings or provided through the parent to the siblings, and then an overall quality of care rating um, from poor to excellent. So no significant changes from before to after our rollout, but I wanted to just put these up to show that consistently sibling support is related much lower in terms of quality than the other areas of care quality that we asked about. Then in terms of bereaved parents, so there were similar findings in terms of the, um, sorry, they were asked the same kinds of questions as parents of children on active treatment. They similarly rated sibling support as the lowest, but they were of course asked some other questions as well. So just wanted to highlight around location of death. So bereaved parents were asked about their preferred location of death and then where death actually happened. So you can see that every family whose child died at home actually wanted to be there. Uh, and in hospital deaths, Certainly, there were many families whose child died in hospital and they wanted to be there, but there were also some families whose child died um, in hospital and that was really not where they wanted to be. Similar for the hospice, not everybody who was there would have preferred that as their location of death. One of the other questions we asked bereaved parents was about regrets. So in talking with clinicians in pediatric palliative care, we sort of asked them, you know, how do you know that you did a good job for a family uh, in providing more of the end of life care for, for a particular family? And some of them said, you know, if I can help a family to feel that when they look back on the experience, they have no regrets, then I feel that I have done a good job. So we asked the bereaved parents who took part uh, whether or not they had any regrets. So great to see that just over 50% are able to look back on their child's end of life uh, with no regrets, but that still leaves almost 50% who do have some level of regret, which of course is a bit concerning. So in terms of the types of regrets uh, that parents shared with us, uh, I would have fought harder for him to have had better quality of care from home care nursing staff. I wished we could have had access to better equipment right from the beginning. I wish we'd been better informed that his death was very imminent. If we'd known earlier about her rare and aggressive form of ALL, we might have forgone the third chemo round in order to have made the end of her life a little bit more comfortable. His location, we wanted to be home. But as parents and siblings, it was hard to know what to expect with having a seizure, how we would deal with it, fear of dealing with the pain he would suffer. So it was easier to be near doctors and nurses. No nurse could be found to attend our community to be with us at our home if he was brought home. I regret we were not really ever able to get ahead of his pain for more than a short period of time. 
So unfortunately, again, we did not see significant changes in terms of the proportion of parents who felt that they had regrets versus no regrets. Similar comments uh, from parents both before and after our rollout, but I wanted to highlight it just to show that there uh, is certainly more room for improvement in the care that we provide across the country. The two areas where we did actually see change from before to after our rollout, the first was around the median time from palliative care referral to death in days. So you, this shows the pre and the post test across the sites that took part in our study. And the overall uh, increased from 68 days to 93 days from before to after our rollout. So certainly a significant improvement taking into account differences in the respondents between uh, those two timeframes, but really nice to see that earlier referral being made to specialized pediatric palliative care teams. Similarly, the time from advanced care planning, discussions of goals of care also improved from before to after our rollout, increasing from a median of 29 days to 35 days. And you can see some sites really uh, went from zero to uh, huge numbers. Uh, discussion certainly happening much, much earlier after our project. We knew that going into this project, there was no um, really great evidence to, uh, to show what we should be measuring, essentially. So um, Going into it, we were a little bit worried that we might not see big changes in terms of all of those quality of care things, but we hoped we were sort of on the right path. So what we did was ask all of the trainers who had taken part in the study to comment on their experiences in the project, to comment on their perspectives on whether or not uh, care was changing. So we asked the, the quality of palliative care provided to children with cancer and their families has improved as a result of this project. So certainly there was almost a third who really didn't feel that there was any impact of this project uh, or minimal impact. Uh, but there was then two thirds who did feel that uh, the project did result in improvements in the quality of palliative care. We also asked the trainers about their perceptions uh, of the frequency of referrals from oncology to specialized palliative care and whether the referrals happen relatively late, meaning in the last week to days of life, or um, uh, and whether that occurs sort of on a regular basis or on an infrequent basis. So again, looking sort of from before to after the project, so seeing a shift towards um, uh, sorry, frequency of referrals. So referrals to pediatric palliative care. So seeing that those uh, referrals are happening more often. So wanting to see a shift towards the always end of this uh, spectrum. And then we were also asking about the timing of those referrals. So how often do late referrals happen? So this in these two questions wanting to see the shift the other way so that we are never seeing late referrals happening. So certainly some still happening, but it was nice to see uh, the shift. Uh, and just to point out as well, I mean, this uh, is similar to the information that we got from the chart reviews, but we wanted to ask the trainers as well, because ideally if referrals are really happening much earlier, some of the kids who might have been referred to palliative care would, would still be alive at the time that we were taking, um, uh, looking at the data. And so we wanted to get this additional perspective. We also asked the trainers just sort of overall what they thought about their involvement in the project and the overall impact that they felt that it had. And so they said new teaching materials allowed our team to bring accessible, comprehensive pediatric palliative care teaching to our team, our residents, and our community. And really people just commented on the, the quality of the information that's available in the EPIC pediatric uh, 
materials that they all had access to. Some people from the pediatric palliative care teams who had been teaching for many years this kind of uh, information were happy to have sort of new resources at their fingertips. Uh, so that was uh, a piece that came out of this project that was helpful. Another trainer said, it has opened up a window for conversations about the integration of palliative care, when it is best to utilize a specialized pediatric palliative care service, and when oncology can do it on their own. More people are talking about it now than before. And I think for me, that is a, a wonderful uh, outcome from our project, just to start the conversation in some places. It goes back to that idea in the uh, model that I showed you around facilitation, evidence, and context. This is really about that context piece. Uh, you have to have the right context. You have to have an openness to involvement um, and provision of pediatric palliative care in order to achieve those outcomes that we were going for. So even making improvements, I think, in that context uh, was an important piece of our project. Another trainer said, overall, I think everyone improved their knowledge of pediatric palliative care. I think the greatest success, and for me, this was unexpected, is the improved relationship with community care providers. They don't see the staff from the tertiary center as untouchable, so to speak. I think they feel much more comfortable calling us to ask questions. This has definitely improved patient care. And I think that was really um, a result of one of the uh, resources that was available as part of our project was was simply money, which allowed the trainers to go out into the community to sometimes bring the community people into the hospital setting in order to do all of this training. And that uh, is particularly applicable, I think, when thinking about the, uh, the territories and Nunavut that uh, health professionals at CHEO, for example, do provide care to children who are in Nunavut and they had never met face to face before with some of those care providers in those um, northern communities. And so our project offered the opportunity to fly them up there and they actually were able to meet face to face, which I think is um, maybe an old fashioned way of developing relationships, but I think very much an important one. And it just, again, helped to open those lines of communication uh, was some trust building. And my understanding is that has certainly continued beyond the life of our project. So some of the challenges along the way, um, multi-site studies are not for the faint of heart. As I said, it took 18 months basically to get all of the approvals that we needed to even do the project at some of the sites. So some of the sites only had uh, a couple of months really to do their education rollout while other sites had um, a year or more. So that length of the intervention period differed across the sites. Um, sorry, there's the length of intervention period. I'm not sure though what impact that had necessarily because I think some for some of the sites where they knew they only had a short time, they sort of all out blitzed and they did as many education sessions as some of the sites that had a longer period of time to work with. They just kind of jumped in and did as much as they could in a very short period of time. Whereas some of the sites that had a bit longer time, there wasn't that pressure there. Um, and so the training was much more spread out. And so there's no research to say one of those is better than the others, that there's a right way to sort of do that piece. Uh, the other point was around finding the right outcome measures. So there are outcome measures around palliative care that are much more focused on sort of the end of life period. And that is where we saw the change. We talk about having a palliative approach to care, but I don't know that we know or have a good enough understanding yet of how to actually measure that. How do we know that a palliative approach to care is actually being implemented uh, earlier in the disease process? Certainly there were competing projects along the time that we were doing our projects. Uh, the trainers who did the training and did this rollout locally, for some of them, for sure, it was part of their role that they already had, that they were supposed to be doing education. Uh, some people 
really took this off the side of their desk and it was their commitment to the project that they found the time uh, to do the pieces. Uh, and I just a huge shout out and thank you to all of them because we couldn't have done what we did uh, without their commitment to the project. The other piece was around that changing culture, changing practice. So it's not an easy thing to do, uh, whether you can do that in a, a year, year and a half uh, is hard to say. I think at some sites, as the trainer said, that there was more discussion between palliative care and oncology about when and how to involve palliative care uh, with the children and families. And I think that's sort of the beginning of a, a change in culture and a change in practice. So thinking back to the reason why we did this project in the first place, really aimed at addressing the lack of education about palliative care for health professionals. We certainly far surpassed our goals for the number of health professionals that we were able to reach with our curriculum, at least through self-assessment, the knowledge of these health professionals uh, appeared to increase. And we certainly saw some practice changes specific to the QI projects that were done at each of the sites. But in terms of the quality of palliative care, um, we, we saw some change, but we didn't see maybe as many changes as we hoped for. So ultimately, did we make a difference for families like Elena's? Maybe not yet, but given the earlier involvement of specialist palliative care teams for the children who died, maybe we've made more of a difference for the children with advanced cancer. Getting palliative care teams involved earlier in the disease trajectory is certainly, I think, an important step forward, but ultimately there's certainly still work to be done so that we can see improvements across all of those quality of care outcomes for children and their families. So we're not there yet. Uh, I, I believe our project was still a step in the right direction. If we got some conversations started, I think that's fantastic, um, but, but we have more work to do. So just to finish off, if you have uh, questions or interested, um, I'll be taking questions in a minute, but if you want to read more, we did publish our protocol in BMC Palliative Care, so that is available. And just in September, the final results from the whole project were published in the Journal of Palliative Medicine, so that's now available as well. So any questions or comments, I will open it up. Thank you very much, Kim. That was a great presentation, a great recap of, of where, where you've come over the years. We, we did this present or a similar presentation early on in your work, so it's great to see uh, the, the results that you, you that you were able to get. Uh, so again, that's our chance to remind the audience to, uh, if you do have any questions, type them in, uh, and we will certainly uh, present them to Dr. Widger. Uh, the first question that came to mind was, so when you were when you were showing the tables of the the, the shifts uh, that you were seeing, so when you were talking about the time spent on, uh, with specialized palliative care before death, or the time from referral to receiving palliative care, et cetera, and you were looking for those shifts in certain directions, what do we know about those organizations that? Like, do we, and this may certainly be beyond the scope of your research, but do we know anything about those organizations or that were able to shift in the right direction versus organizations that weren't? So, for example, you know, just even if it's just your opinion on knowing some of those organizations, were they more well connected or networked or geographically close to the specialized pediatric centers? Or like, is there anything you can tell us that, that might lead to other organizations being able to mimic that in order to achieve those kinds of changes? Um, I think some of the sites that saw the biggest change were the ones that um, they were starting with nothing, so to speak. So, I mean, they were starting quite low. And I mean, you can see that across um, 11, 12, 13, 14 there, where the biggest gains were, were the ones that actually started off the lowest. So in some ways, I mean, they just had more room for improvement. But I think some of those sites, and I keep the sites anonymous, um, didn't have a lot of interaction between a specialized pediatric palliative care team, or in the case of one site, it was an adult palliative care team who'd never even thought of consulting each other before. And in fact, at, at that site in particular, uh, it's gone both ways. The adult palliative care providers realized that they had a lot of children of their patients. So they're providing care to adults with cancer and other life-threatening conditions. And those adults had children and they realized that we need help 
understanding how to support those kids. So they started consulting pediatrics in order to provide that support. And then on the flip side, which was what our project was about, of course, was the uh, pediatricians caring for the kids with cancer in the community and the oncologists realized that we have this expertise in the building, but we'd never really thought about would they be even interested in providing care to some of our uh, patients. So, you know, in those cases, it was kind of easy to some degree to just start consulting. Uh, And it wasn't for a lack of uh, uh, belief. It was just simply not knowing each other. Right. Uh, the next question that came in is from Mary, and she's saying she previously worked in BMT as a as an RN at sick at at sick kids. Uh, mm-hmm. She was she's asking was this population included in this research data? And she just goes on to say BMT typically has a high mortality rate, but palliative care is usually introduced very late. For example, in the ICU when the child is actively dying. Yeah. So I mean, if a child was particularly ill, um, we wouldn't have approached them to take part in the study in terms of filling out the survey. But absolutely, in terms of our vision of what palliative care should look like in pediatric oncology would be that uh, those kids getting a bone marrow transplant for advanced cancer, maybe they've relapsed a couple of times, that we should consider involving the specialist pediatric palliative care team with the idea that they can uh, provide ongoing symptom support throughout uh, the process and whichever way it goes. And I think that's that's the idea of uh, incorporating a palliative approach to care is both that there are times when it makes sense to bring in the specialists if there are particularly difficult symptoms, challenging family situation, Uh, that the oncology team needs that sort of extra layer of support. But also, and the main goal of our project was really to enhance the knowledge base of the oncology teams so that they could provide that care on an ongoing basis. Um, so So I guess to say, you know, we weren't specifically targeting that population, but my view would be that those uh, families would absolutely benefit from at minimum, a palliative approach to their care, um, but certainly also could benefit from having a specialist team involved earlier on in the process. Uh, there were a few um, a few people asking a similar question. Mary, Mary actually followed up with with this question, but we did have a few other people sort of suggesting they had the same interest in recognizing that this work was focused on cancer uh, and pediatric mm-hmm. oncology. Uh, is, is there any plan to expand this beyond pediatric oncology? For example, children with long-term medical complexities with de- degenerative conditions, et cetera, that could benefit from palliative care over a number of years. Like, or did you just in just in looking at this? Is there any? Do you see any barriers in translating this across other diagnoses or anything unique to the oncology population that makes it work there, where you think it might may or may not work in other populations? Um, so, really, our focus in oncology was because of our funder. So, <laughs> so it was. <laughs> funded by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. So that was really who we had to focus on as part of this project. But absolutely, um, I mean, all of the palliative care teams now across the country have access to the Epic PEDS materials. And I know they are using this across all of the education that they do. So absolutely not just within oncology, but they're going out and doing it with other in other populations as well. Similarly, the people that were involved in the project from the community, like I said, were were often general pediatricians or home care nurses that provide care to children with cancer, but also provide care to lots of other people. So um, I don't know that anyone is gonna give me enough money to, to roll this out in the way that we did before. I think the challenge in doing it in other populations is just more that that population is quite undefined. And so in order to do the whole measurement piece around what's care like before we start and what's it look like after, um, that would be more of a challenge. But uh, just getting people to do the training and rolling that out to other people within those other care teams can certainly be done, um, not even as part of a big project. Uh, I mean, anybody can can become a trainer uh, by, if you just Google Epic 
pediatrics, actually, you'll get to the website, which is now based out of Chicago. Uh, and you can pay, I think it's about $2,500 US for the tuition and to get access to all the materials, but anybody can go and do that and then disseminate that knowledge. All right. And with that, I think uh, I don't think there are any more questions here. If you do have any last questions, your fingers are flying on the keyboard. Uh, we, we may be able to take one more. We do have a couple extra minutes. But uh, if I don't see anything uh, soon, I'm going to hand it back over to you, uh, Dr. Widger. Just if you have any uh, closing comments, any key messages you'd like to send the audience off with and seeing no questions, maybe we will just go ahead and, and wrap it up here. If you do have any anything you'd like to leave the audience with before we before we leave. Sure. So just to say, um that the Epic Peds curriculum is being has been rolled out across the US. There are similar projects to ours actually going on now across Latin America and in Australia, and I believe just starting out in India as well. So this is really rolling out internationally, which is just incredible to see. Uh, but I would say if you are at an institution that has a pediatric palliative care team and most of the um, tertiary pediatric centers in Canada now have one. So there are people in your institution who have done the training and are trainers. So for those people outside of oncology that haven't had any exposure to um, this training, you can certainly also approach your pediatric palliative care teams and ask them to come and do any of the modules or any uh, portion of this. I'm sure they would be thrilled uh, to do that. So reach out. And with that, a perfect way to wrap up then. Definitely, uh, I would echo that. Reach out uh, to Dr. Widger and to all these, all of these other folks in your local institutions that, that have this expertise. And, and I think we can all do uh, work together to do a better job at uh, administering pediatric palliative care. So thanks, uh, thanks again, uh, Kim. Uh, you know, great presentation. Always great to hear your work and where you are uh, with this, uh, with these projects. And certainly look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Great. Thanks very much for the opportunity right. to share our work. All right. You're welcome. All right. We do our webinars every Wednesday at 11. And when you do uh, watch live, you do get to ask your questions and contribute your comments. But when you can't be here live, uh, we do record the sessions and make them available after the fact on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, and that being said, we typically do them every Wednesday, but we are heading into our conference season. So this is our last webinar for uh, a few weeks, about four weeks, I think we take off over our uh, during our conference, which again is October 21st to the 23rd in Edmonton, Alberta. And if you go to the CAFC.org website, you can certainly find all the information about the conference and we certainly encourage you to register and join us out there but when we come back in November we do have lots of interesting topics related to mental health related to reporting of adverse events to children and youth and lots of other great topics if you do sign up uh, if you do want to hear more information about the webinars please do sign up for our uh, email newsletter that where you can find out about all of our upcoming webinars and as well uh, be notified of when our recorded uh, webinars are available uh, and you can also find that information on our website so thanks again for joining us today a great presentation uh, from Dr. Widger today and our, and our colleagues at SickKids and uh, we hope to see you uh, back next week. Bye everyone.